Let me just say, I'm glad to be with you. I hail from the great city of Longview, Texas, as ever said, and that is over behind the Pine Curtain in East Texas, in case you've never been up that way. Uh, I have uh, been at my church for a few years and I, I, I see a lot of similarities between the church I serve in and your church. We've both been through a dramatic relocation in the last few years and that's exciting. I've gotten to be part of some of that as some of you probably have here. And it's always great to see God's people come together and and get together and pray together and work together to accomplish something great. And now your church has a great presence in this community that has just blown up in the last few years with population and people. And, and God has you strategically placed right here in the middle of it for a reason to be the voice of the gospel in this city where you are right now. And so uh, we have similar stories, but it took a lot to get here, I know. And the buildings that we're sitting in and the buildings that we use here for tools, all those things came because people gave and worked and prayed together. And the same thing is true at my church. And I, I have a fascination with building. I just love to watch things being built, probably because my dad was a home builder. So when I was a child in the summers, I would go with him from job site to job site and uh, watch all, he would go talk to the subcontractors and I would wander around and pick up stuff I wasn't supposed to pick up and look at stuff. And I was fascinated with all kinds of things, but I love to watch guys lay brick. My dad came around the corner one day and I was just sitting there watching this guy laying brick and he's just buttering those bricks and lining them up straight. And it was just he goes, what are you doing? I was like, this guy's amazing, dad. He just is like fast and he doesn't ever miss a beat and they're straight when he gets through with them. And so I have a fascination with, with building and that's kind of what I wanna talk to you about a little bit this morning in just a few minutes that we have together. You probably built something in your life that you're proud of. Maybe it was a business, maybe it was a, your dream home and you got to put everything exactly where you wanted it or maybe it was for you guys, your man cave, your shop, your garage, all your tools are right where you want them until your kids mess with them and move them around and whatever. And so maybe there's something like that in your life. For me, I don't build homes, but I actually like to build cars. So I'm kind of a car guy and I love to take things all the way down to the frame and tear them all apart, re rebake them, re repaint them, re put them all back together and see if it runs at the end, you know, but I like that process. I like it because it's intentional and it's, it's purposeful. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about from one, just one verse of scripture found in Ephesians. So if you want to take your Bible and turn to Ephesians four and look in verse 29, there's a verse there that's very familiar. It's on the screen, very practical this morning. And if we can just get the truth of this scripture in just the few minutes that we have together, then when you walk out these doors in just a few minutes, you will be able to do some things differently that will have a huge impact on the people in your life. And so this is what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 29. He says, no foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. What I wanna to talk to you about this morning is how to build the life of someone you love. And it's not your life I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people in your life that you love. You could probably identify several names of people right now that you love in your life. I wanna to talk to you about how to build their lives up because this, this scripture is so incredibly practical and easy to apply. There's really three big ideas here that I wanna just land on in a few minutes that we have together. And the first idea is right in that first sentence and it's the idea of restriction. Most of us don't like restrictions. We're Americans, right? We're free people. We don't want anybody putting restrictions on us. We've lived through a year of incredible restrictions on our life but most of us didn't like it. We didn't invite it. We didn't want it. If you're a kid here today, your parents put restrictions on you. You don't like it, right? And you remember if you're a parent, what it was like to have your parents put restrictions on you and you don't like it. We don't like to be restricted. But when the scripture restricts us from something, it is a good thing. It's for our good, often for other people's good. And so what Paul's saying is, if you're gonna build the life of the people that you love, there's some things you can't do you're restricted from doing them. And what he says here is let no foul language come out of your mouth. Now, in New American Standard, it says no um, unwholesome talk. Some say corrupt words. Well, you probably think, well, he's talking about curse words. What we say in East Texas is cuss words. You know, the words you're not supposed to use, you know, the adult words, the dirty words. He's not talking about cussing, just cussing. He's talking about words that come out of your mouth that literally are rotten because the original word here means to rot or to decay. If you've ever been around anything that is rotting, that was once alive, you know it. Like if you go to your fridge today and you open it and there's something in there that's not what it used to be, it's transforming <laughs> into something else. You're like, oh, there's something very wrong in this refrigerator. And you'll start pulling stuff out and you'll find it and you'll be like, that's it. 
I bought this, it was okay. Now it's not okay. Now it's rotting. Because when something is rotting that used to be alive, it creates an odor and you become aware of it. And that odor tends to linger. So you may have to get the Febreze out of the air freshener out and, and freshen up your house because that's the way our words can be if we don't restrict our words. And what this scripture seems to suggest is that you have self-control. I've heard people say, well, I can't help it. I just said what I said, I can't help it. That's not true. You did say it, but that's not true. Because the scripture says that we have the ability to not let that happen. You say, what about James 3? James 3 says, no one can tame the tongue. It's set on fire by hell itself and no one's able to tame the tongue. But it also says in verse two of James 3 that the mature person is able to control their tongue. And, and so when you get to a level of maturity in your life where you go, I gotta restrict some things in my life, especially in the lives of the people that I love. There are times to not say certain things. I remember several years ago, I was a youth pastor for a very long time. And um, this has been years and years ago, but I still remember this. There was a girl at youth camp and she was a student athlete in very good shape and did track and field. And at the end of the week of camp, we would have a time for the kids to stand up and talk about what they got out of camp. And you know, if you've been to camp, you know, that's sometimes a very emotional time. And for this girl, she stood up and she was crying and that's not uncommon at youth camp. But what she said, I've never forgotten what she said because she said, the other day, my dad came into my room and my dad said this to me. He said, well, you're, you know, you're a great athlete. You're competing at a high level, but have you looked in the mirror lately? Your legs are big. And, and that's not, you say, well, that's not a curse word. No, but it's a rotten thing to say to your child. Rotten. It still stinks today. It lingers. And I bet if I could bring her up here and ask her, what's one of the worst things anybody's ever said to you? She'd say to you, well, when I was 16, my dad, yeah. Now, was he honest? Was he being honest? Perhaps. Did he need to restrict what he said to her? Absolutely. Because in that moment, those words actually tore her down. And, and that's an example of a rotten thing that someone said to her. Now, let me ask you a question because you're thinking about it now, what's the most rotten thing somebody's ever said to you? Because you probably don't have to think about that very long to remember it, because it lands on us. And when someone says something that's corrupt or rotten to us, it leaves a scar. Uh, you know, I think we live in this culture now where, where everybody feels like they have the right to say whatever they wanna say and everybody's just gonna have to take it, right? And sometimes Christians fall into that same little world where we say, you know what, if I'm thinking it, I'm gonna say it. Or if I'm feeling it, you're gonna hear it. Whether I say it on social media or I say it to your face. Well, let me tell you something. Paul says, you don't have the right to do that as a follower of Jesus Christ. You don't have the right to just go off on somebody because you feel like going off on somebody today. That's not how you build a life you love. Early in my marriage, I've been married 27, 37, sorry, 37 years. <laughs> She's not here. I've been married 37 years to the same woman and we didn't have any premarital counseling. We were young. We didn't know what we were doing and that's okay. We figured it out. But early in our marriage, like two or three weeks into our marriage, we kind of had our first big knockdown drag out, you know? And I think it's okay to have those because you got to work it out. You got to figure out what life's going to be like together. And so I was saying some stuff to her and she stopped me mid-sentence and she pointed her finger at me <laughs> and her name's Christy. And she goes, be careful. She goes, you be careful what you say to me because you can't take it back. And I was like, what are you talking about? I can't take it back. I have a big brother who sat on me for years and made me take everything I said to him back, you know? So yes, you can take it back. She goes, no, no, not with me. You be careful what you say to me in the heat of the moment. I was like, what is this? You know, I mean, you know what? She was right. She's the most precious person in my life as a human. She said, be careful because your words can land in a way that leave a scar for a very long time. They can linger if they're corrupt words. So that's the negative side of this is we can all fall into that place and maybe you're thinking about somebody you landed some rotten words on. Hey, look, you can go back. I don't know that you can take them back, but you can go back and ask for forgiveness for those things. Even if it was a very long time ago, you can own it and God's grace can cover that. But the reality is going forward, with the people that you love in your life, be careful. 
Be careful because your words can have an amazing impact for good or for bad in their lives. So that's the first big idea this morning is restriction. We're not gonna stay focused on that because the message is not a negative message, but that's in the scripture. Don't let unwholesome words or corrupt words come out of your mouth. But the second thing I wanna talk to you about this morning is intentionality. And I love the word intentionality because when you talk about building something, if you're gonna build something that's gonna wind up being a good thing, you have to be intentional. You have to have a plan. There's a purpose behind it. There's steps that you take. And with your words, each of us have the ability to pour into the life of someone else. We have the ability to be intentional in what we say and build up other people. Um, What would happen if you looked at yourself and the words that you say to the people that you love as the essential building blocks of their life. If you believe that that was true, then you'd be very intentional about saying the right things at the right time in order to build their life up. The, the, the word here in the Greek is oikodomon. It means basically edifice or to edify it. It's an architectural term. It means to build something up. So it's literally this idea of Paul saying that let your words build someone else up. So if that's true, who are you basically the general contractor for? Whose life are you the general contractor over? Well, I would say, first of all, your spouse. Because think about this, if your spouse doesn't receive edification from you, where do they get it? Who's gonna edify them? Where should they look for that if you as the person who's committed to spend the rest of your life with them doesn't do it for them? But on the other hand, we'll talk about it in a minute, you have the ability to give them a great gift through the things that you say to them. But our spouses need to hear. Oftentimes we know our spouses better than anyone else on the earth and they know us. So we know the good things and we should call those good things out in them because sometimes you know how it is in your life. You can't see the forest for the trees. You know the bad stuff about your life. You know the stuff you don't like about your life. Every once in a while, more than every once in a while, you need someone to call out the good things in you that God's given you gifts to be able to do. The spouse, our spouses can often be the person who does that. What about our children? I mean, I mentioned the girl a second ago, but with our kids, we have the ability to build up their lives. And whether they're 10 years old or 21 or 30 or whatever their age is, they still still can benefit from us building them up and encouraging them because kids live all their lives being able to remember the things their parents did or didn't say to them. It's very powerful, the influence of a parent in a child's life and a grandparent as well. But flip that on its head. What about parents? Some of you have aging parents and you can get frustrated. My mom passed away several years ago and I was her chief caretaker at the end of her life for several years. And it got frustrating. She got to where she couldn't hear and she couldn't remember things. And I I get frustrated with her and and my wife would say, why are you getting frustrated with her? She can't help it. (laughs) You know, she really cannot help it. And I'd have to pull back and say, man, but even, your, even your, your older parents, you have the ability to bless them with your words, to build their lives up. Even though their lives may be ending on earth, you have the ability to say to them how they blessed you and what a blessing they were in your life. But if you're a student at home, a child or a teenager, you also have a responsibility to your parents to build them up. As kids, we just take and take and take. Our parents give and give and give, and we just think that's the normal way it ought to be. But when you know Jesus Christ, That changes. Even as a kid or a teenager, you become someone who should encourage your parents. They might drop out faint if they hear you say something encouraging to them. They might, but that'd be kind of fun, wouldn't it? To watch that. I mean, really, that'd be a blessing to them. Most parents never get that. I think about school teachers. Man, school teachers teach, and especially this past year, we've been through teaching online, teaching in person, all the extra work. And a lot of times, a lot of school teachers get into that because they want to serve God. They wanna help kids learn. And they have a a mission behind it in their heart. And some of you who are Christian students treat them just like everybody else. You're disrespectful. You're not caring about them. What if you gave your teacher a good word, a word that would edify them and build them up? Not to get a better grade, not for an ulterior motive, just because they have value to God. What about your siblings? probably have siblings. The guy came up to me at the last service. He goes, I have some siblings that I haven't talked to in a very long time. That happens, doesn't it? It's things that happened in the past separate you and you're no longer close. You don't talk. You still, as the person who's close to Jesus Christ and has a relationship with Jesus Christ, you still have the ability to edify them and build up their life. And it can be a great, great thing. And then there's this group of people that we don't talk about very much, but this group of people that we all know in our lives who don't know Jesus yet. 
Maybe they're neighbors, maybe they're friends, maybe they are relatives, maybe they are a sibling that has moved away from their faith or doesn't have any faith. But we all know people who don't know Jesus and we wanna have those conversations. And I don't know what's true about Bear Creek, but at my church, most people in my church don't ever talk about Jesus when they leave the building, anywhere. They love to come and hear the great music and sing just like you do. And they love Jesus, but man, when they go out there, they don't ever talk about him because they know that the culture can cancel you. The culture can recoil against you if you talk about Jesus. And you could pay a price for that. In the days ahead, I think we will but that doesn't change. Our love for Jesus shouldn't, right? So why don't we ever talk about Jesus? Because we know that people object. And oftentimes we, we try to talk to Jesus like, like about death or where are you gonna go when you die? And people go, why aren't we talking about me dying? I don't even know you. I don't, what are we talking about, right? But what if, what if you allowed God to let you, to use you in their lives to be an encourager? not to get them to do anything, but just to demonstrate their value because God does value them so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for them. So I'll tell you a story. Several years ago, my wife wanted to go to a gym. She wanted me to go with her to the gym. I'd never wanted to go to the gym for any reason. I mean, I'm a skinny guy and skinny people don't hang out where we're weightlifters, you know, lift weights and do all that kind of, I didn't want to go to the gym. I was like, honey, I don't want to go to the gym. It's too reminiscent of high school. I just really don't want to go to the gym, you know? She's like, come on, we need to. We're getting to middle age. We need to work out. Well, she was right about that. And so I went to the gym with her and she went for a while and quit. Well, I loved it. I enjoyed it. After I got over the initial shock of being the skinniest guy in the room, I was like, that's okay, you know? And what I loved about it was for 40 years of my life, I've done ministry, which means 99.9% of the time I interact with Christians at church, in ministry, all the things that I do. And I never really had any ongoing interaction on a, on a regular basis with people who don't know Jesus. I mean, I see people at the grocery store, but I didn't have any relationship with them. But at the gym, it's kind of a unique situation because if you go to the gym about the same time every day or when you go, you see the exact same people because they are a people of regimen. They're people of schedule. And so uh, I just began to look at it as, wow, this is, this is really good for my faith. It's refreshing to interact with people who don't go to church, don't use church language, don't talk about church. And, and, and it's gonna give me a chance to share my faith with people. And it was exciting for me. And so I'd pray before I get out of my car, Lord, I don't know what I'm gonna find at the gym today or who's gonna talk to me or who I'm gonna talk to, but I am looking forward to it. I'm ready to pray with somebody. I'm ready to talk about Jesus with somebody. And if they never talk to me again, that's totally fine with me. That's, I'll just work out. Cool. So this guy walks in uh, several weeks after I started going, young guy, he's about mid twenties, his name is Jesse. And Jesse comes in and, and, and he just starts interacting with me. Like, I, I don't know if he saw me as a father figure, what I could have been his dad, you know, I'm twice his age. And so at that time, anyway, and so he starts talking to me. And what I found out about Jesse is that Jesse's a bartender at a local restaurant. And this is what his life is like. He just has a nowhere life. He's like, I go to work, I work till close, um, clean the place up, us and all the wait staff go to another bar in town and get drunk and we stay till two or three or whenever they close it down. Then we all drive home and he's had multiple wrecks on the way to his house. Every corner of his vehicle has been in from where he's run into something because he drinks and drives, which is nuts, but he does it. He goes back to his house where he lives with his mother. He sleeps all day, gets up about noon, comes whatever, one o'clock, two o'clock, whatever, gets some wrecks, something to eat. Then he comes to the gym. Then he changes clothes and goes to the bar or the restaurant and bartends. That's his life. He's been in prison for a couple of years. He's gotten out. He wants to be a nurse someday, he says, but he doesn't know if he's gonna be able to do it. But he's just, he just has this nowhere life. And so he and I, he says, one day he says to me, well, you know, I'm just trying to find things about Jesse's life that I can encourage him in because I know God loves Jesse. Jesus died for Jesse and Jesse, regardless of what his behavior is, is an incredibly valuable person to God. So I'm just trying to live that out. I'm trying to be encouragement. And he senses that and he draws near to me. And so he asked me one day, he said, can we just work out together? Cause we're here at the same time. We end up talking a lot. And I was like, sure, I don't even know what I'm doing. So yeah, I'll just follow you around and do whatever you do. That's great, you know, <laughs> perfect. So it's like several days into that. And this is the question I always get at the gym that I love this question because guys will come up to me and they use curse words and they just talk like people who don't know anything about me and whatever. And that's just the way I used to talk before I knew Jesus. So it doesn't really bother me. It doesn't offend me. I mean, I'm just like, don't talk to me like that. No, I'm just like, hey, be your friend. You know, that's not the issue that you use foul language. That's not your problem. Your problem is you don't have a relationship with God. That's your problem. That's a symptom of your problem. So anyway, Jesse asked me this question, which I love, which took up several days for him to get there. He goes, well, hey, what do you do for a living? I wait for a second. I said, well, you believe it or not, Jesse, I'm a pastor. Oh, 
he starts thinking about all the stuff he said to me and all the words he's used with me. And I said, dude, it's cool. Don't worry about it. I still like you. I, I didn't, you know, it doesn't change our relationship at all. Okay. So Jesse tells me after a couple of months or whatever it was, several months of working out with him, he tells me that he's going to move to Dallas and work at a big bar up there. And this is his future. He's got a great future lined up. And I said, Jesse, I don't really think so. I and I'd been talking to him about Jesus. I'd bought him a Bible, which he never read. He never really got to the place where he would put his trust in Jesus Christ. But he, he didn't hate me for telling him. And I said, look, Jesse, I'm praying for you, but I don't think this is your future. I don't think this is what God has for you. Well, I'm gonna do it. I think it'll be great. So he moved off to Dallas. I lost contact with him. He didn't return my text messages. So he's just kind of out of my life. I'd pray for him occasionally when I think of him. And then a couple of years later, I see Jesse pops up on my newsfeed on Facebook. But this is a very different version of Jesse. Jesse seems happy. Um, and he's talking about on his social media, he's talking about Jesus Christ. And I'm like, what in the world happened to Jesse? This is so awesome. I wasn't a part of any of this. What happened, you know? So I look on his pictures. He's got a wife. She's going to have a baby. He's a nurse now. I interact with him. Jesse, last year when COVID hit, volunteered to go to New York City for two months and work in a shelter by himself. Wore all that PPE stuff, all that. He did that because he now knows and loves Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't have much to do with that part of it. Yeah, praise the Lord. I mean, that's awesome. So I contacted him. I said, Jesse, what is going on with you, man? I, I'm seeing all this stuff about Jesus and you have a life now, a real life. And he was like, I know, man. He said, I got to thinking about, I went to the bar thing. It didn't work out like you said, it was a dead end. And I got so frustrated, I just hit a wall. And I thought, man, I remember what you said about Jesus loving me and wanting to save me. And I just thought, this is the last, my last hope. If I don't put my trust in Jesus Christ, I don't know where I'm gonna wind up. I don't wanna go back to prison. I don't wanna do all that junk again. So I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And then I met this woman who loves Jesus and we got married and now she's gonna have my baby. And, and I'm a nurse, I finished nursing school. Man, Jesse's life is full of great things now. And I love that, I love that. And it all started with me just saying things to him to build him up, just earning the right. Not because, I, listen, y'all even do it so he would become a Christian. I just did it because he has value and God did the rest. And so when you think about going out and telling people about Jesus, and most of us are scared to death to do that, why don't you just think about going out of here and, and the people that are already in your life, your neighbors, your relatives, your work associates, the people you're at school with, the hobbies that you have. Why don't you just think about trying to pour into their lives and build them up? Because what you'll find is that they will come near to you because they want that. They need that in their life. And, and, and what I would say is this, you know, if you could think about for just a second, what is the most encouraging thing anyone's ever said to you? I asked you a second ago, if you could remember what the most rotten thing anybody's ever said to you, think about the most encouraging thing anyone's ever said to you. And what I would like you to do when you leave here, because most of you are going to lunch or you're gonna be at lunch with somebody today is just start that conversation and say, hey, our pastor today at church asked us to share, just to go around the table and share what, what's one of the most encouraging things anybody ever said to us. So just do that at lunch today. Just keep the conversation going. If it's with your family or some friends who weren't even here, what a great way to start a conversation about a great thing. So I encourage you to do that today at lunch. The reality is this, every time we come to church, it's an opportunity to encourage and build someone else up. And I, I don't know what happens here all the time at Bear Creek, but I know this, that if, if each of you, before you got out of your car, every Sunday you came here or Wednesday night when you're here, if you would just ask the Lord, Lord, who's one person today at church that I can build up? Who's one person that I can say something encouraging to? Not, not fluff, but sincere encouragement. Who's one person? That if that was your goal, every Sunday when you came here, this place would be transformed. And people out there would, be, would want to come in because they'd be like, what's going on there? And we have that gift, we have that ability. If we're intentional about building people's lives up because Hebrews says, encourage one another daily lest you be hardened by sin's deception. So that's one of the reasons we're supposed to gather together is to encourage one another. And instead of thinking about it like, well, I'm gonna go in the room and I hope somebody's gonna encourage me. I really need encouragement. What if you turn it around and say, I'm gonna give some encouragement away. You'll probably get some too. But what if you said, I'm gonna encourage somebody today? Cause you never know who's sitting here who really needs it, but God does. And he's got the master plan and he's the one that can decide that and drive that in our lives. Well, 
I can think about many times in my ministry, I'll share one quick story real quick about a thing I used to do with kids when I was in youth ministry. I would occasionally, every once a quarter or something on a Wednesday night, I would just have a, I would call a kid out and I'd say, hey, come stand down here by me. And I want four volunteers to stand up and not silly stuff, but sincerely just complete this statement. One thing I admire about you, about whoever the person was. One thing I admire about your walk with God. Some way you've really encouraged me. And so we would do that and kids loved it. They would be like, is this the night? I think, no, this is not the night. I'm just always surprised them with it. And of course, there was always kids that, I wanna go, I wanna go, I wanna go. Cause they wanted to, they wanted to hear it, you know? And usually I would call a leader up that everybody knew and I'd get 14 or 15 volunteers and I'd let them all go, you know? And it was a, it was kind of a rich time of creating a culture of encouragement in our youth ministry. One night this kid shows up on the parking lot and he's all gothed out. I mean, he is just black and studs and piercing and I don't, none of that stuff bothers me. I think he had mascara on, who cares? I don't care about any of that stuff. It's all an act. It's all a package, you know? So he's down in the parking lot and I'm like, well, he can't be hanging out. I'm gonna go out there and talk to him. None of the kids would go out there. They knew him from school, you know? So I went out there and said, hey, shook my hand, stuck my hand. I said, hey, my name's Paul. I'm the youth minister here. I said, uh, what's your name? He just looked at my hand. Didn't say a word. I was like, okay. I said, well, here's the deal. You can't be on the parking lot. So if you're here, I hope you're here to come in. If you are, come on in tonight. Here's what we're gonna do. Somebody invites you, not a word, nonverbal, man. I mean, he's totally hard shell with me. Okay, cool. I said, well, you can't be out here just hanging out in the parking lot. So I, I want you to come in, but if you're not gonna come in, you're gonna need to leave. And he's like, he didn't say a word. So I waited for a while, went back in. He comes in, sits on the back row, doesn't say a word to anybody. The kids in the youth group are like, what's he doing here? They know him, you know, what's he doing here? I'm like, look guys, we, I get some kids together afterwards. I'm like, he comes back. You guys need to reach out to him. Jesus loves him. His life has value. Okay. He actually came back. The, nobody talked to him. He came back the next Wednesday night. And this time he came in on his own, still wouldn't talk to anybody. So for weeks, he would just come in. He would just come in, sit in the back. Like his kids started talking to him. And then I noticed he started kind of talking a little bit, interacting a little bit. So his shell was breaking up. His little facade was coming down a little bit. And so one night I thought, I'm gonna do something to my youth group. So I had, his name was Sam. I said, Sam, why don't you come down here and stand by me tonight? I didn't know if he'd do it. He got up and came down there. I said, I need four volunteers to stand up and say one thing you love about Sam. <laughs> Sam, okay? And they, they were as quiet as you are right now. Kids, you know? And I was like, so who's first? One of my leader guys raises his hand, you know? And then a couple of us, there weren't 14. They were, I had just to stand there for a while to get four, okay? And so finally they raise their hand and they stand up one at a time. And they, they honestly look at Sam and tell him something they like about him. And it was hard for them because there wasn't a lot there to go from, you know? Well, Sam got more and more involved. It started breaking down. Sam finally gave his life to Jesus Christ, dropped the goth thing completely because that wasn't who he was really. That was just an act. He was just trying to fit in with something, trying to fit somewhere. He fit with Jesus is where he fit. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ and it ultimately became a, just a huge part of our youth ministry. Well, that's a beautiful thing, but it starts with people being willing to get into your life, a person like that, and just overlook the shell, overlook the well-defended heart and just begin to speak encouragement to him. So you have to be intentional. The last word I wanna share with you this morning and then we're done is the word generosity. So we love to think about people who are generous. We hear stories about people who are generous and most of the time when we think about generosity, we think about money. But the reality is Paul says here that your words should give something to the people that you love. What is it, we, we, they should give grace, he says, to the people that you love. Well, what is grace? Well, I don't know how you define grace, but a, a simple definition for grace is getting what you don't deserve, what you didn't earn, what you couldn't deserve if you tried as hard as you wanted, but it was just a gift, no strings attached. Well, when your words are able to give grace to people, then they give things to people that they don't deserve. So you don't wait until people deserve them to share them with people. You share them with people, even if they don't deserve them. Let me go back to your spouse for a second. So you're having a little knockdown drag out with your spouse about something, right? Not getting along, not communicating very well. And in that moment, you may begin to think, I just wanna win the fight. I'm just all about winning the fight. This is all about, it. I was right, you were wrong, blah, blah, blah. And in that moment, maybe the Holy Spirit taps you on the shoulder because you're a follower of his. And he says, hey, why don't you give your spouse grace right here? Oh no, my, grace doesn't, my, my spouse doesn't deserve it. No, no, my spouse is wrong and they're gonna learn a lesson. They don't deserve it. 
did you deserve grace from Jesus? Do I deserve grace from Jesus? No, and I won't ever, and I don't have to. I've been given grace. We just sang about it. So how, how could I withhold grace from somebody else? But we do. But your words could actually give grace to your spouse in that moment. And it's a gift. Your words could give grace to your kids, whether they deserve it or not, whether they've earned it or not, like to your coworkers, to your neighbors, to your sibling that you haven't talked to in 50 years because you don't agree. Your words could give grace if they're designed to build up. And that's what Paul says we have the ability to do as followers of Jesus Christ. I, I often text my son. My son is a pastor. He lives in Anchorage, Alaska. He's been up there for a couple of years and um, he's following God's call in his life. And I'm like, wherever you go, I'll find you. Don't worry about it. Just go do whatever God tells you to do. And I'm happy for you and excited for you. And uh, so typically on a Sunday, when I finish my church services up at where our church is, it's about this time, a little after noon or whatever. And they have church at 9.30 up there and they're three hours behind us. So when I'm leaving at 12.30, their church service is just starting. And usually I know he's gonna be behind the stage getting ready to come out and preach. And so he'll have his phone with him. I'll text him sometimes, hey, praying for you today. Hope everything goes well. Hope you have a great day. I love you, whatever, whatever. So last Sunday, I don't do it every Sunday, but I just occasionally, but last Sunday, the Lord just led me to do something different. And I thought, you know, I'm so proud of my son, but when's the last time I told him that? When's the last time I really told him how I felt about him? So I thought I could tell him as I have done that before, but I think I'm just gonna text him because they don't have a record of it then. He can go back and read it over and over again. And I just said to him, so I texted him, I said, Hey, I just, I just don't ever want this to go unsaid that I want you to know how incredibly proud of you I am and that I love you and I love who you are and I always have. And P.S. I'm not dying. Okay. <laughs> I did say that because <laughs> I don't send that kind of text every day to him. And so, you know, how you send a text to somebody and you don't hear back from them, it kind of, especially when it's one like that, where you go, that's going to get a response, you know, nothing crickets. I mean, no response. I mean, all day Sunday afternoon, I'm waiting. I'm looking at my phone, nothing. Well, it kind of undoes it if I got to text him and say, did you get the text? You know, so I just waited. Monday afternoon, I get a call from him all the way till Monday afternoon. I just, like, whatever. I know, I know he loves me. So Monday afternoon, he calls me and said, dad, just want to say, I'm sorry. I just now getting back. It's been a crazy time, but man, I so, so thank you for sending me that text. He said, I really needed that. And I really appreciate that. And I always know that about you, but you always try to tell me. And I just, I never get tired of hearing it. And I was like, well, you're, you're welcome. And he goes, but I wanna ask you a question, dad. He goes, what led you to do that yesterday? I was like, I don't really know. I mean, I just feel like the Lord led me to do it. I don't really know why. He goes, well, that's, that's interesting because he said yesterday was a hard day. It was actually a bad day. He's a pastor and not all sermons you preach are like, you know, and he felt like his sermon didn't land. He felt like he wasn't as prepared. He didn't do well. And he didn't get three times like we do here. I mean, it's like one shot. He gets up once and does it. If he doesn't get it right, it's over with. He doesn't get a redo, you know. You guys are getting the refined version. The eight o'clock crowd got the, you know. So he was like, that didn't go well. Then after church, there were some meetings and that was kind of tough stuff happened there. And so, you know, just ministry stuff. But he said, your text was exactly what I needed to hear to kind of make yesterday okay. Now, that's a gift. The best gift you can give your kid, your spouse, your friend, that's the best thing you can give them, better than anything monetarily you could buy them, is a gift of your words full of grace. And so today, in just a minute, as you leave, I wanna encourage you to do something with this. Don't just be like, oh, we heard a sermon, okay, whatever. Go out of here, and before you lay your head on your pillow tonight, apply that to your life, use it. Actually take the time to build somebody else's up, life up that you love this, today, do it today. Whether it's a call, a text, a card, an email, whatever it is, communicate to the people that you love something encouraging to build them up because it matters. It has weight and significance. And if you follow Jesus Christ, that's what he did in his ministry, all his ministry, built people up. And it's a chance for us to do that in other people's lives. So what I wanna do is pray for you. So would you allow me just to pray for you as we close the service out today, that as you go out of here, that God will just multiply the things that you're gonna do in, in people's lives today. Father, I do pray that as every one of us leave here, that you'll put someone on our heart today that we can build up. Your kingdom is beautiful and your kingdom is encouraging 
and it's life-giving. And thank you that we get to be part of it. So I pray that you would bless these folks as they leave here to represent you at restaurants they're going to, with their families, with their friends, with whatever they're doing. And then I pray it would just carry on through the week, Lord, that Bear Creek Baptist Church would be an incredible place of encouragement every time people gather. I pray these things in Jesus' name today. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Hey, want to say thank you to being here. I want you to know that um, God has such a great plan and purpose for your life. He loves you. Um, every day that you go through this week, know that he is with you and watching over you. And listen, if you don't have never experienced God's grace personally, if you don't know him personally, that's the one thing God wants. God is pursuing you, but if you've never said yes to him and you've never accepted Christ, we want to help you with that. It's simple as just text BC Hope. just one, le- one word, BC Hope, to 84576. Our pastor has a brief video there and some ways that you can just start on that journey of having a personal relationship with God each and every day through Jesus Christ. Also want to let you know that immediately following this service here in the worship center, we're going to be kicking off the Media Safe Home Seminar. So as you leave, um, if you're sticking around for that, you can um, head on out and stop by the information center. They'll give you some instructions. You can grab your lunch if you've registered. If you haven't, we hope you'll stay. We're going to give away any extra lunches we have. If you want to go grab something and come back, but it is free. It's here in the worship center. We, we actually planned on doing this over a year ago and then COVID hit because I don't know, I've got a 21 year old, but when she was a teenager, I felt overwhelmed by the whole social media stuff and how to help guide her in that. And all the pressure and the things that our kids face. We know the impact it has on us. So we want to offer this to you free. We've got a guest that's come in and he's going to lead us in how as parents, grandparents, as um, teachers, as anybody to help create a media safe home and love on our kids and help protect them, experience the good, but avoid the bad of all that's there. So it's free and you guys are welcome to stay. And if you're joining us online, we hope you'll come. Um, It'll start in about 30 minutes. Hey, I want to thank Paul for being here. Um, I, I've, I grew up in Longview. I've known Paul, um, known of him. And so him being here and filling in for Pastor David is a great blessing. Um, he and my brother, my younger brother, serve at the same church. So um, I, it's privileged to have a connection to, to them at Moberly. And even before my brother got there, just knowing of them in that area. Wonderful church, very much like Bear Creek, full of love, cares for one another, a family of believers that serve one another and the community. So thank you for being here. Let me pray for you guys as we get ready to go. God, we love you. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus. God, for the opportunity opportunity to show grace through kindness of our words. God, help us not to withhold blessings that we can give to others just by the kindness of our words to one another. God, I pray that that would fill our lives as we leave this place. And God, we thank you for the truth that you've put in us today. Now, God, we pray for Pastor David. He just continued to recover from the procedure he had um, at the end of this week. And we look forward to him being back next Sunday as we continue in this series on Does Christianity Work? God, we look forward to learning and growing closer to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you all. We pray you have a great week.